So like the Greeks, the Romans have a founding mythology. And where did they come from? Why was Rome established? There's a lot of mythology around that. In, in fact, in some cases, some Roman writers, um, Virgil, for example, wrote the Aeneid. He claimed that during the Trojan War, some refugees from Troy traveled an epic journey and landed in Italy in Rome and founded Rome. So this way, the Romans in their uh, psychology and their mythology, they could say we were um, descendants of the great Trojans. So we have this great mystical lineage. Uh, one founding myth is that Rome was founded by two brothers. Who were the two brothers who founded Rome? Some famous brothers who were raised in the forest by Sheewulf. And there's a famous bronze statue of two babies suckling on a she-wolf, raised by the she-wolf. They're Romulus and Remus. You've heard of Romulus and Remus? And Romulus and Remus, interestingly, uh, and as will become significant later, had a falling out. They, wanted to, they were rivals. They became rivals and wanted to establish different cities. And Romulus established his city on one of the seven hills of Rome, on the Palatine Hill and Remus established on the Aventine. And later on, we will see that Romulus, the Palatine Hill, became the home for the wealthy in Rome, and the Aventine became home for the poor. So over time, there were a number of wealthy families in Rome, wealthy founding families, patricians they became known as. However, the Rome was ruled by these Etruscan kings, E-S-T, R U C A N. The Etruscan kings ruled Rome, and the wealthy families were kind of tired of this. The wealthy families of Rome wanted to rule themselves. And so another myth goes, we're on to our third myth now, a lot of founding myths in mythology in Rome. A, thir a third myth goes that an Etruscan king, Tarquin Superbus, Tarquin, raped the daughter of a patrician family, of a wealthy family. He raped Lucretia, the rape of Lucretia, a very famous Roman story, Roman myth. And Lucretia is devastated with the shame, again, being a traditional society, this is a shameful thing. And she um, tells her family what happened and commits suicide and stabs herself. And her brother, Brutus, Brutus Tarquinius, takes the knife from her body and vows to drive out the Etruscans from Rome and avenge his sister, and says that as long as I am alive, there will be no kings in Rome. No kings in Rome becomes the lesson of this myth. So the founding mythology always has a reason behind it. The founding mythology uh, in the rape of Lucretia's story is that there shall be no kings in Rome. So if the kings aren't going to rule, who's going to rule? Well, the wealthy patrician families decide to rule. So this word patrician and pater or padre, etc., you can tell the Latin root is father. So these founding fathers of Rome, these patrician families. And even today, the word patrician is used to describe a wealthy family, a wealthy family that's long established. So people would have thought the Kennedys and the Roosevelts and others were patric American patricians. So these founding fathers, the patrician families decide to rule and the mechanism they'll use to rule is the Senate. They will, the, from these families will be drawn senators. And these senators will deliberate and discuss and dispatch the people's business. Res publica, the people's business, the republic. And everyone in Rome will be a citizen. So we have a senate and we have citizenship, citizens of Rome. And that's a very powerful idea that we're all in it together. Because the Etruscans tried to come back. They tried to conquer Rome. And the citizens had to rally together and drive them out. And as on the Tiber River in Rome, there was a bridge. And as the Etruscans are coming, goes another myth, the myth of Horatius at the bridge. Horatius bravely went onto the bridge and cut it down and fell into the Tiber in order to stop the Etruscans from attacking. And he eventually survived. And, becomes a hero of Rome. So that's another idea of citizenship, that the citizens will defend Rome. So Rome is, in its psychology, is a very special place. 
It's got a, something other people don't have. It's got this great founding mythology. It's got citizenship. It's got the Senate. It's got these patrician families. And the Romans feel very proud, feel very proud of themselves. So we have this idea, the people and Senate of Rome, PQRS, is on their battle shields, etc. PQRS, on their battle standards where you see the eagle and the gold standard, PQRS, the people and Senate of Rome. And they have this idea that their, their way is the best way, and so if they're conquering their neighbors, they're spreading their ideas, spreading the values of Rome. So Rome is a republic, and Rome has these republican values, values of citizenship, values of a democracy, of a senate. But Rome starts to grow. It starts to uh, conquer the Italian peninsula, and it starts to uh, get more wealthy. And so what we start to see is a rivalry, or what's called a social war between the classes. And you saw some of this in Athens also. So a social war, or a war between, between classes, the upper class and the lower class. And this has a very destabilizing effect on Rome. And there are various episodes where, for example, the poor of Rome go on strike. They retreat to the to the Aventine Hill and refuse to work, for example. And so they negotiate with the senators, with the patricians. And so, for example, citizens, regular citizens get an assembly where they can hear, have their voices heard. They get tribunes who are representatives who can speak in the Senate on their behalf, tribunes, in the tribunate. And so democracy in Rome starts to grow. And other elements of Rome are it's a very male-dominated society. Women don't have representation. Women don't have rights. There's this idea of pater familias, the father of the family, where the father has absolute power of life and death over his family, pater familias. And you have cases where they could kill their wives and children out of hand if they um, insulted them or if the children weren't um, what the, the father had wanted. Cases of deformed children in, in Rome, they would be... Um, they would be killed out of hand. So Rome's got this very distinct idea of what society should be, very strict idea. And as we know, as we mentioned, it's a classical world, so the Romans worship the same, a similar pantheon of God than the Greeks, and the gods um, animate what they do, uh, just like the Greeks. So Rome starts to get wealthy. It starts to conquer the Italian peninsula. Because you need to know where Rome is. It's in the center of the Italian peninsula. We know Italy, we know where it is in, Ro in Europe near the Mediterranean. And it's the long boot that stretches out, supposedly kicking Sicily, the Italian boot. Well, Rome, that's the peninsula, Italy, and Rome is in the center of that. And as Rome prospers, it begins to conquer the surrounding areas, the surrounding towns. And as money and wealth and prosperity starts to come back to the Romans, it goes to the patrician families. They become increasingly wealthy. And they try to placate the lower classes. They try to placate them. And one way they placate them is by giving them a bread ration. And another way is to give them distractions. So you have this famous term, bread and circuses. I'm not sure what author came up with it, but that's how Rome kept the lower classes placated, bread and circuses. Bread to eat and circuses for what? Hmm? To keep them entertained, to keep them distracted. Do we have that today? Do we have bread and circuses today? A lot of similarities between Rome and, and modern society. What's, what keeps us distracted today and keeps us entertained? Reality TV. Reality TV. Yeah. Those are, those are circuses. What, were, what did, were circuses in ancient Rome? I'm sure you've heard some of the, um, the circuses or the distractions. You've heard the gladiators, right? Gladiatorial combat and the Colosseum, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, absolutely, we've got our distractions today. As long as people are fed and happy, right? They will ignore what the powerful interests are doing. And so this is a very important and constant concept in Rome, the relationship between the upper classes and the lower classes. And the upper classes, the patricians, are very aware that they have to keep the plebeians in their place. The lower classes are called the plebeians, the plebs for short. 
This is where we would be, unless any of you are of noble or patrician birth. We'd be the plebs, the lower orders of society. We'd be kept fat and happy with bread and circuses. And, but the patricians seek to gain the favor of the plebeians. They keep them in line. And there's two groups of patricians. There's the optimates. which is translated means the best men, and other patricians who are known as the populares. Now the optimates say, look, we founded Rome. We drove out the Etruscans. My father's father, I, I am part of this leading aristocracy. My father's father's father was related to Brutus who drove out the Etruscans. We have a noble name. Our family has always led the military battles. We deserve our position. We deserve our standing. We are the best men. And they're very proud of that, and they don't apologize for that. That might be a difficult concept for us, because we have this idea in modern times in this country of equality. At least on paper, we say, no, everyone is the same. No one, regardless of where they're born, is better than anybody else. That's the theory that we hold to. But the optimates would say, no, we founded Rome. Rome relies on its patrician families. They sacrifice of themselves by leading armies. They sacrifice their wealth to feed the poor. Rome's stability relies on relying on the best men, the best family. And so that's the argument they would make. Now the populares would say they're also wealthy patrician families. And they would say, we need to listen to the poor. We need to reform. We need to make life better for the poor. And we need to um, improve their lot in life. So they asked the poor for their support in the, in, the, um, in the marketplace, in rallies, in forming armies, in forming street gangs. They try and rile up the poor to be on their side by giving them gifts and giving them benefits. The optimates would say, these people, you're just riling up the poor. You're promising them, you're promising them benefits. But you're not being sincere about that. You're just doing that disingenuously. You're just doing that to get them on your side. The optimates say it's better that the best people lead. Populares at least pretend to give a voice to the poor. And so we see different Roman senators, and you could say, well, he was really an optimates. He was really a popularis, trying to get popular support. That looks familiar to anything that happens today in our society today? Who are our optimates? And do we have popularities who promise things to the lower classes? So in some respects, it, it's kind of like the, um, our political parties, right? The Republicans and the Democrats. Republicans say, you know, this, this country is a great country, and it's great because wealthy people need to have room to do well, and it will work out for everybody. Let's keep it that way. And Democrats say, well, we're going to help. Vote for me. I will help you. I may be wealthy too, but you know I'm looking out for you. Don't worry. And the optimates would say, well, you're not really looking out. You're just trying to rabble rouse and get people on your side. You're not really looking out for anyone but yourself. So it's kind of that debate. And we see it a, a little bit today in our Republican-Democrat debate. And you can make an argument for each side and say, well, at least the optimates, or let's say at least the Republicans today, at least they're honest. At least they're saying, well, we're looking out for ourselves, and that's better for everybody if people can look out for themselves and have the freedom to look out for themselves, or, the, and, or are the popularities really the best option? Are they looking out for you? And you can endlessly debate that and let you debate that for yourself. And that's what we have to debate at every election, right? <clears throat> so, and there's a famous case in Tom Holland. He talks about the Gracchi brothers. And you can look this up in the index. The Gracchi brothers, who are popularists, who really try to bring in reforms to help the poor in Rome. And they want to radically reform Rome to benefit the poor, the Gracchi brothers. Well, come to find out that the other optimates, the other patrician families, have the Gracchi brothers murdered. And they say, you've gone too far. You're riling up the poor. And they're eventually murdered. They betrayed their class, and they were murdered for it. So that's a famous case of a popularist getting murdered for riling up the poor, essentially. 
And so we can start to see how Roman society is, is broken up, how Roman society is divided. But as we said, Rome is getting wealthier. It's conquering its neighbors. It's looking out to the Mediterranean. And Romans look at the Mediterranean, and they call it Mare Nostrum, our sea. And they look right and look east and look west, look right and look left. And they come up against a rival state in Carthage. Carthage is founded by Phoenician settlers in North Africa and modern-day Tunisia. And so it's several hundred miles from Rome. And so it's a, in a direct rivalry with Rome. And it makes me think when Rome was founded, there was this rivalry between Romulus and Remus. And now Rome is a mature city. There's a rivalry with another mature city, Carthage. So who will win out in this battle for Mare Nostrum? Who will win out in this battle of the Mediterranean? Because another thing about Rome is it's got this very proud idea of itself, but it's also very skittish. It's also very nervous. When Rome was a, a weak city-state, they had to drive out the Etruscans. And Rome was also invaded by the Celts, the Gauls from modern-day France. So about 300 BC, the Gauls sacked Rome. And Rome is very skittish about that. And so Rome has always got this kind of inferiority complex where they can't stand any rival. Rome cannot abide a rival. Rome seeks to dominate. And you can see in these patrician families as well, their glory is everything. They're very ambitious. Archaeologists, when examining ancient Roman villas and cities and digging, would, would, were surprised at the absence of toys. So children didn't have toys in their youth. Children were raised in a somewhat harsh regimen. And they would, especially in these patrician families, if you're born into a patrician family, you might say, oh, well, it's a, it's a powerful patrician family. They have wealth. They have luxury. But there were real demands placed on these patrician families. You had to outdo your father. You had to outdo your father's father. If you had a proud name, you had to defend and carry on that name. If your father was consul, which just means heading the Senate for a year, if your father was consul, then you're going to have to outdo that. How do you outdo that? If your father had led the Roman legions in battle in Campania in Italy, how are you going to outdo that? How are you going to outdo the deeds of your father or grandfather? If you're walking the hallways of your villa, you're living in luxury, but on the wall are all these battle standards that your grandfather or your, grand or your great-grandfather had won in battle for Rome. And the people are looking up on the Palatine Hill, what will you do with that? And if you don't do it, another rival family is going to do it. So the families are in this constant rivalry. And to me, that's the overriding characteristic of Rome, is this ambition. And Shakespeare talks about this in, Shakespeare talks about this in um, Julius Caesar. The ambition of the Romans is very important. So you write that down, ambition. Patrician families were driven. Patrician families were ambitious. And this has consequences for Rome. Remember, we started out the discussion saying, how did Rome rise and fall? What's the morality play? And even we can go back to the Greeks and we can think of ambition and pride. All these things can be dangerous. And so they're starting to get dangerous in Rome as well. If patrician families are trying to outdo themselves, trying to step over each other, be more powerful. We can see with the Gracchis, they were ambitious in trying to rile up the plebeians. So now, as Rome, Rome gets into battles with Carthage, it wins the first Punic War against Carthage, and it conquers Sicily. It wins battles in the east, and conquers in the east as well, and conquers the old Greek city-states and the wealthy cities in Ionia, the wealthy cities over here in the east. And wealth starts to come back to Rome. It goes to these patrician families. So they're added to this rivalry is enormous wealth. So if a neighboring patrician family gets this enormous wealth from Pergamum, a city in the east, gets a governorship in Pergamum in the east and starts bringing all this wealth home, you as a patrician might see, see the need to work in the Senate so you get appointed to the east. So you can take your army, your legions to the east and also seek to get glory and wealth for yourself. And so Romans are constantly trying to do this, constantly seeing where can we conquer next? Where can I get appointed to next? What political position can I get? And so you see this in all the works on Rome. This makes up the plays like Julius Caesar is the scheming and political maneuvering and wars far afield. 
So all of a sudden, this republic, which seemed like a noble idea, the people managing themselves, drive out the kings, all of a sudden it becomes this powerful entity that's conquering all of Europe. This powerful entity with this wealth coming back, corrupting Rome, corrupting the republic. And writers at the time and other senators would bemoan the corruption in Rome. So Romans start to get this idea around 150 BC, what has happened to our noble republic? What will happen to our noble republic? So greed and ambition, you can start to see the morality play. This is the morality, greed and ambition that's coming from these wars, like the Punic Wars, is this corrupting Rome. And there's various episodes such as Spartacus. Who's Spartacus? There's a TV show on Spartacus too, right? Who is Spartacus? No. Who was Spartacus? He wasn't a, a leader, a Roman leader. Spartacus was a gladiator. Anyone watched the whole, wasn't it Showtime or something? I watched the first episode, I was kind of bored. There's a great movie in the 60s with Kirk Douglas called Spartacus. It's a fantastic movie. And Spartacus is a gladiator. He's captured in Thrace, which is in Greece. He's captured and he's brought back to Rome as a gladiator. He becomes this fierce gladiator. But the gladiator school where he is in the Italian countryside, there's a revolt, and he leads it. He destroys the gladiator school and starts recruiting slaves. Rome is a slave society. And so Spartacus starts recruiting slaves and starts raiding up and down the peninsula. And so in the Senate, they're a little worried about this. A slave revolt is a worrisome thing. But in addition to being worried, what are other leaders thinking? What are other patricians thinking in addition to being worried? They're thinking this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for glory. If I can be the one to defeat Spartacus. And so one patrician in particular, Marcus Lucinius Crassus. Crassus, C-R-A-S-S-U-S. -S -S. And Tom Holland talks about Crassus and Spartacus. You want to look that up in Rubicon. He talks about Crassus and Spartacus. And Spartacus is eventually defeated. Spartacus while he goes down in history as being this heroic figure leading a slave role, he's actually kind of a greedy figure in himself. And he figures this raiding and raping and pillaging up and down Italy is too good. They could have escaped Italy and gone back to where they came from. They decided to stay and continue raiding up and down Italy. It was too good a deal. It's funny how in history, movies make people out to be heroic. And Spartacus is a heroic figure in, in the 1960 movie and certainly in the Showtime show. But really, they were more interested in raiding and pillaging. And this was the age of raiding and pillaging. In any case, Marcus Lucinius Crassus works with the Senate and leads an army to defeat a, uh, Spartacus in a brutal campaign. And he gets the glory for that. And Crassus becomes very powerful, a powerful patrician. And then in the east, Rome is expanding in the east. And they're conquering all the old Greek territories in the east and getting enormously wealthy. And there's a leader out there, uh, Pompey. There's another great leader, Pompey. And he gets the glory and the wealth from conquering the East. He conquers all, most of old Mesopotamia and claims that for Rome. So he comes back to Rome, is given a victory parade, and is feted in Rome as a great warrior, Pompey. So we have Crassus and Pompey become two of the most powerful patricians. And then there's another young leader who comes from a Julian family, a very powerful family, Julius Caesar. And he's considered an up-and-coming, powerful leader as well. And between them, they become the three most powerful patricians in Rome, Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey. So whereas Rome started out with a, a senate with many leaders who each year would elect a consul, the patrician rivalry and the wealth has led to a circumstance where there's really just three powerful voices at or around 100 BC. There's three powerful voices in the Roman Senate, Crassus, Caesar, and Pompey. All the years of scheming, all the years of seeking to gain wealth has led to these powerful blocks of Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey. So the Republic is getting less flexible. The Republic is getting almost more monarchical. And this is, this is called the first triumvirate, the three leaders, triumvirate, who informally rule everything behind the scenes. Crassus has the money, Pompey has the military glory, and Caesar has the notoriety. 
and he also, they also have money and, and other kinds of glory as well. And so Rome has conquered Carthage. Rome defeats Carthage in the first Punic War. And then a Carthaginian leader come, rises to take on Rome again. A, a famous Carthaginian leader gone down in history is the greatest general in history. Anyone know who he is? Hannibal. Hannibal, the Carthaginian general. What's Hannibal's most famous episode? You have heard of Hannibal crossing the Alps? Hannibal crosses the Alps on elephants, supposedly. He's coming from Africa, and he almost defeats Rome in the Second Punic War. But the Romans, the Second Punic War really shows that the Romans are persistent. The Second Punic War and their Battle of Cannae, where the Romans suffer about 30,000 casualties. But they still persevere. After Cannae, a weaker city would have, where Hannibal destroyed the Roman legions at Cannae, a weaker city would have given up. 30,000 was a heck of a lot in those days. Certainly a heck of a lot at any time. But in ancient world, population levels were lower. But the Romans lost 30,000 soldiers at the Battle of Cannae to the Carthaginians. Many thought that was the death knell of this great Roman Republic. But the Romans persevere, and Hannibal's lines are stretched. He's a long way from Carthage. And eventually, the Romans win the Second Punic War. And so Rome is fat and healthy, but it's also become corrupt and far too wealthy for its own good. And the republic is being lost. You have senators like Cato and others who are bemoaning the lost republic. And Rome is also has this inferiority complex, and Rome also can't stand a rival. So it's looking across the seas at Carthage. And Carthage is just a shadow of its former self. But the Romans get this idea that Carthage must be destroyed. And there's this famous saying that's gone down through the ages. Cartago est de lenda, or Cartago de lenda est. Carthage must be destroyed. Cartago est de lenda. It's gone down in history as this famous, when you're fixated on something, they must be destroyed. Cartago est de lenda. Carthage must be destroyed. And so you'll see in Persian Fire, in Tom Holland's book, you see about the rivalry with Hannibal. And perhaps it's the fact that Hannibal and the Battle of Cannae and the Second Punic War inflicted such a psychological wound on the Romans that they can't stand to leave Carthage alive. Carthage must be destroyed. And again, there's some parallels with our society today where we have a fixation on certain enemies, Rome had this fixation on its enemies like Spartacus scared the heck out of them. The Gauls scared. Roman children were told tales of the Gauls sacking Rome. The Gauls scared them, and eventually Rome under Caesar will conquer the Gauls. They can't abide their enemies. Do we have scary boogeyman enemies today as well? And even back in pioneer times, or Native Americans were called savages. They scared us. And today our, the terrorists are scaring us, right? And so our foreign wars are led to try and conquer these scary enemies. And so Carthage must be destroyed. Even though Hannibal is a shadow, even though Carthage is a shadow of itself, Carthago est delenda, Carthage must be destroyed. And so the Romans, perhaps because some patricians want to lead, want to get some glory for being the ones who destroy Carthage, they lay siege to Carthage. And it goes down in history as almost a genocide where they destroy they lay siege to Carthage and destroy it and burn the city to the ground, sell the, kill all the men, sell the women and children into slavery. And the story even goes that they sowed so salt into the soil so nothing would ever grow there again. That's not really true, but it, it's told to kind of reinforce the point that Carthage was destroyed. And so what has happened to Rome? And so Tom Holland paints this episode of Africo uh, Scipius the Roman general, standing over Carthage and weeping because he sees a great city being burnt to the ground, even though he's the one who burned it to the ground. So what is he thinking? Perhaps he's thinking, wow, great cities can fall like this. Or perhaps he's thinking, what is the morality of this? What will happen to us? Will there be karma? Is it, will, we, will our nemesis arrive? Will there be comeuppance for what Rome has done to Carthage? So that's the story of Carthage. And what we want to do in the second discussion question is talk a little bit more about that. What does Tom Holland say? Can you tell the story of the Punic Wars, one, two, three, and use quotes from Tom Holland to outline the story? What's the morality? What's the moral of the story with Rome and Carthage?
the idea of Cartago Estelent. But getting back to Rome, what's the morality play of Rome in general? How did the Romans lose their republic? So we can see that the republic has come a long way. As it's gotten wealthier, as the patricians have gotten more powerful, its greed and ambition is bringing down Rome. And so there's a serious rivalry between these three. And they're all jockeying to be the most powerful. Pompey has the Senate in his hands because he is the, the most senior. He is the most prestigious for his conquests. Caesar needs wealth. So Caesar looks at Gaul. And he says, I'm going to be the one to conquer the Gauls. And Caesar, for eight years, he spends conquering Gaul. He goes on a campaign, and the Celts have a lot of gold, so he gains his wealth there. He's gaining glory for leading a campaign in Gaul. So Crassus needs to do something. Crassus has significant wealth. People forget he was the one who conquered Spartacus. So he decides to lead another campaign in the east. It's just fascinating insight into the Roman psychology that someone as wealthy as Crassus felt he needed to prove himself and go all on a large campaign to try to conquer the area of ancient Persia. But it doesn't go so well for him in Persia. And eventually, the Persians capture him and decapitate him. And the story goes, they pour gold, molten gold, into his, into his um, decapitated head to prove that he had come for greed. He had started a war in Persia for greed. And so Crassus is out of the picture. And we're left with this rivalry between Pompey and Caesar. And Caesar's notoriety and success in Gaul scares Pompey and scares Pompey's senators. And they say, well, let's eliminate Caesar from the picture. Let's say that he should not have started the war in Gaul. It was an illegal war, which is a strange thing for the Romans to claim. So they ask Caesar to come back, to disband his legions, to come back into Rome and answer for his crimes. And Caesar knows what's up. Caesar knows that this is a setup. And the story goes that Caesar must disband his legions before crossing the last river into Rome, before crossing the Rubicon. And so if you look at the cover of Tom Holland's book, you look at the cover, there's Caesar crossing the Rubicon. They say he should have disbanded his legions before crossing the Rubicon. He doesn't. He crosses the Rubicon with his legions. He rolls the dice. That's the story. And that's a famous expression throughout history. I don't know if you've heard it, crossing the Rubicon. So what, is, do you think that, what do you think that means, crossing the Rubicon? Well, you've crossed the Rubicon. Well, that would be crossing the Rubicon. Crossing the line? Crossing the line? Taking, a Taking a big risk. So you're going past the point of no return. When you've crossed the Rubicon, you've gone past the point of no return. You've gambled everything. And that's what Caesar does. He gambles everything, crosses the Rubicon. And that's why this um, book is called Rubicon. It's about everything leading up to that and what comes after when Caesar crosses the Rubicon. And you can see that painting on the cover of Persian Fire. You can see there's these like figures of death, mystical figures of death in the background because they know that Caesar crossing the Rubicon is a harbinger of death. And so Pompey can't believe it, and he ends up fleeing Rome, and Caesar hunts him down, and Pompey is eventually murdered in Egypt by people who want to impress Caesar. Cleopatra's associates murder Pompey. Pompey seeks to flee to Egypt because he has friends there, so he thinks. He steps out of his boat, boat and he's stabbed and decapitated in front of his wife for those who wanted to side with Caesar. They wanted to impress Caesar. Well, the funny side of that story is when Caesar gets to Egypt, he says to the Egyptians, who the heck do you think you are killing a Roman? And he has the assassins of Pompey executed said, you had no right to kill Pompey. He's more respect for Pompey than he does for the Egyptians. And so Caesar rules. And now the Roman Republic has come down to one man. This great republic where they had driven out kings, no kings, has come down to Julius Caesar. And so this is where the famous story in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar takes over, where the other senators are nervous. The other senators who sided with Pompey are nervous that Caesar will declare himself a king that Caesar is too ambitious, that Caesar will punish them. So what do they do? They murder Caesar, the famous episode where the senators stab Caesar in the Senate, the murder of Julius Caesar. So now Rome is in complete anarchy and chaos. The rival camps who were behind Caesar and behind Pompey duke it out. Mark Anthony and Octavian take over. They have a dispute. Octavian takes over. He becomes Augustus, and he becomes 
emperor, the first emperor of Rome, Caesar Augustus. Augustus becomes the first emperor.